The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is a proud supporter of Indian Country Today. Students at Cronkite News and Gaylord College at the University of Oklahoma cover indigenous communities together. This important work is distributed by more than 100 news organizations. This collaboration provides a much needed boost to coverage of Native American communities nationwide. Learn more at cronkitenews.azpbs.org. is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh. thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Tholohungva. Here are the headlines from Indian Country Today. Natives in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area are finally receiving COVID-19 vaccines. More than 65,000 Indian people live in the area, and there are no urban Indian health clinics or Indian health service facilities. So the National Council of Urban Indian Health and Native American Lifelines teamed up to distribute the vaccine. The University of Maryland, Baltimore, will host the vaccination site. Francis Cravier, the CEO of the National Council of Urban Indian Health, explains they don't even have the proper facilities to serve their people. So the time to act is now for full funding for IHS. They can see the need. Um, and so that needs to happen. I mean, $42 billion is not a lot of money in the grand scheme of what is being spent by now, right now, but would really mean a huge difference to the Indian health system and really save a lot of lives. Urban natives started receiving the Pfizer vaccine last week. Two major funding opportunities to improve broadband internet on tribal lands are on the way. Last December's Consolidated Appropriations Act includes $1 billion for the creation of broadband networks for tribal governments. The act also sets up the $3.2 billion Emergency Broadband Benefit Program. That will provide up to $75 a month for tribal households to pay for internet access. It also provides $50 a month for eligible households in other areas. In addition, the American Rescue Plan's $20 billion will be going to tribes for broadband infrastructure. The U.S. Treasury Department must release rescue funds to tribes by May 10th. There's a new initiative in South Dakota to teach civics and history, and educators say it should also include the history of Native Americans. The initiative is supported by $900,000 in state funding. Teachers or schools will be able to choose the materials they use in their classrooms. Jay Stukori, who is Lakota, is a history professor at Black Hill State University. She says many students who take her classes have never had courses focused solely on American Indian history. Educators also talked about ways to help teachers so they feel more comfortable and equipped to teach this history. South Dakota News Watch reports it will take two years to create the materials, so there may still be time to include Native American history as an option for schools. Well, score one for wild rice. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency is disapproving one of Minnesota's long-standing practices. The state's decision to exclude waterways with high levels of sulfate, which is deadly to wild rice, violates the Clean Water Act, according to the federal agency. The 11 tribes in Minnesota have raised this issue before. Now they are encouraged by the EPA's decision. The food itself has cultural and spiritual significance for the Ojibwe. And you can read more about this story on our website, IndianCountryToday.com. And the full story is by Marionette Pember. Australia, a motorsports program believed to be the first of its kind in Australia, is training the first all-Indigenous racing team. Indigenous teenagers are handpicked to learn skills that will help them behind the wheel and under the hood. At a Brisbane, Australia racetrack, Braden Sedoni tests his skills on the tight turns. Race car driver all the way, yeah. It's always been my dream. A dream that could become reality for the 17-year-old, thanks to his mentor, Paul Morris, who's opened the doors of his business, Motorplex. Young people are being taught how to get the vehicles race ready put the exhaust back on today. The other day we took off the alternator. So I've learned a lot about cars since being here. Delaney has helped build a team car from scratch. He'll also manage the pit crew at upcoming races. Founder Gary Connolly helped start the program with Morris. Connolly is a race steward on the international Formula One circuit and helped create the Racing Together program. 
Well, we realise that there's uh, little to no representation of our Indigenous people in motorsport in this country. It's a, a sport where it doesn't matter what gender you are or where you come from, the car doesn't know who's driving it. Those involved were handpicked from around 100 applicants who had their coordination and reaction times tested. There's hope the young Indigenous people in this pilot program will be the first of many. The dream is to one day find young motorsports fans from across Australia to support the team. The only requirement is a stomach for speeds up to 125 miles an hour. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Thalahungva. When we come back, take in a question from outside the Beltway. It might have just stumped the White House Press Secretary, Jen Psaki. Congress just passed the American Rescue Plan and includes $4 billion to address COVID-19 in Indian country. Reporter and producer Aliyah Chavez was able to ask White House Press Secretary Jan Psaki about this funding. Let's listen to her question. Thanks for having me. I'd like to follow up on the fact sheet that was released this morning from the White House regarding its investments in combating COVID-19 in Indian country. The plan for $2 billion for third-party billing in the Indian health system shows the significance of Medicaid and other insurance programs. We know that some states are stingy with Medicaid regulations. Does this plan demonstrate the need for tribes to be treated like states so that they can develop their own eligibility rules and priorities? Well, uh, let me just give you all a sense, because everybody may not be aware of the announcement that we made this morning. Um, so we, um, uh, let's see here. Um, through recently passed legislation from Congress, we announced um, uh, additional funding, additional resources that will be made available. And so today we announced $4 billion from the American Rescue Plan to support COVID-19 response and health care in Indian country. And we will continue to partner and we will work directly uh, with uh, tribal nations uh, in distributing critical resources and ensuring that funds meet the needs of Indian country. So I would say that just as we are working with states directly, we are working with local communities, we have our own federal program pharmacy programs and other programs, we will work directly with Indian country to ensure that they have the resources, the funding, the vaccine uh, supply needed in order to get the pandemic uh, under control. Aaliyah joins us now. Aaliyah, she didn't answer your direct question. She didn't, but she did give me uh, some more information about the White House Tribal Nations Conference. Uh, as a lot of people know, the White House Tribal Nations Conference is an opportunity for tribal leaders to meet directly with the president and members of his cabinet. And uh, we weren't sure if this was going to be reinstated, even though uh, President Biden did campaign on this promise to tribal nations. Um, and on Friday, we learned from Press Secretary Jen Psaki that the, the conference is aimed to happen in person and uh, hoping for later this year. It's interesting, the reason they had the White House uh, Tribal Nations Conference in previous years at the Interior Department is because there's no room big enough at the White House for that size of a delegation. That's true. And the other part of it is that it has also expanded. So it's not just a conference for tribal leaders. There's also a youth conference now. And so um, it's unclear if that youth conference will be reinstated as well. But uh, we do know that the, the conference for tribal leaders will happen. The other thing that we learned um, was that uh, a lot of the COVID relief funding from the American Rescue Plan is hoping to be dispersed to tribal nations here soon. Um, they said that they will plan to spend $4 billion in additional funding on Indian country and um, COVID relief. It's interesting that one of the aspects of that is $2 billion for Medicaid, when officially in the budget, Medicaid is only about $1.3 billion. So it's a real acknowledgement that Medicaid is far more important than anyone has been acknowledging, at least in budget terms, before this point. 
And that's something that I really pushed for, a question that I think a lot of us have of the White House and of the Biden administration is if tribal nations should be treated like states in determining uh, Medicaid eligibility. And Mark, I know you know a lot about that. Um, and I know you've said before that um, you know funding like this is, is so beneficial for um, full funding of the Indian health system. Well, and the big reason for that is the you know, Indian health system has to be appropriated dollars every year, whereas Medicaid's automatic. If you're eligible, the money is always there. And so it does, as mentioned, open up full funding. What, what, um, what was your just impressions of being in that process at the White House? Oh, it was very overwhelming. Um, a, a key part of being there was very much the fact that Indian country and native reporters don't get access like that often. And so for me, it was just a huge, huge moment to represent Indian country and Indian country today. Um, and I'm hoping that, you know, we get more opportunities like that in the future. Aliyah Chavez, thank you. Thanks so much. A court battle is brewing in Ohio. It's between the state's historical society and a country club. Marionette Pember's story about the case is on our website now. UNESCO honors ancient earthworks hit snag. She joins us now to give us more details. Marionette, welcome. Hi, Mark. Marionette, you've uh, tell us a summary of the story involving the country club. Well, the Country Club is, uh, has leased this land um, from the Ohio History Connection. Um, actually, they leased it for like more than 100 years. I think it actually predates the official leasing time of 1930. But it's uh, uh, this land that contains the Newark Earthworks, which is this like over 2,000 year old um, earthwork that was constructed by a civilization here in Ohio that uh, you know predates uh, the the recognized tribes that were removed later in eight, in the 1830s so they are like probably one of the oldest earthworks in the United States built by indigenous peoples and they they're remarkable um, obviously have something to do with, with these folks' uh, vision of the heavens um, and uh, of lunar cycles. So the uh, Ohio History Connection would like to um, vacate the lease that uh, the uh, Mound Builders uh, Country Club has and open, uh, open up the site to visitors and actually um, go for, move forward with proclaiming it uh, a UNESCO site. However, the um, the mound builders, uh, golf club people, they really don't want to allow people very much access because they really want to keep it open for golf. And they only allow it at present, I think like four different times a year. In the Ohio History Connection, folks are complaining, well, we can't really list it for UNESCO, the World Heritage Listing, unless people can actually access it. So we, we they actually offered them a pretty significant sum of money, I think like $1.8 million, but the mound builders, felt that that was not an offer, quote unquote, in good faith. And they want something in the range of $12 million. And it's been appealed a couple of times and it's at its final appeal process now but before the Ohio Supreme Court. Wow, in a way that's good that they're just arguing about the amount if that <laughs> comes down to it that way. Um, let me ask you this. So one reason why this is so important is the master narrative about indigenous people in North America is that we are a rural people and stories like this talk about the urbanization of North America, that there were great cities here, not unlike the rest of the world. And by having that history strip takes that all away from us. Yes, and you know, it's, it's kind of interesting when you hear the current narratives regarding who built those earthworks and why. It's often attributed to aliens or in the more outlandish kind of narratives or that somehow it was this um, random tribe of somehow European people that came here and built this earthworks and then left. It's very seldom attributed to indigenous people, which is, is you know, an appalling form of racism. Um, when we look in Great Britain, they have a great deal of earthworks and many of them, you know, roughly in the same time period and these folks really elevate them and preserve them. So, I mean, it's, it's, um, there's many levels to what's going on with the way that um, our public um, views and cares for the earthworks here in the United States. Is there been any talk of condemning the land and turning it to public use that way? Well, they are looking at basically they would be, you know, doing um, using eminent domain 
and um, that's you know um, kind of the the process and I guess through the kind of unique legalities of the way eminent domain is normally used here in Ohio they felt that their offer of um, this 1.8 million dollars was not in good faith so they're really down into the weeds of uh, the legality of eminent domain and I think probably the um, Ohio history connection is going to win what do you think's the next step then if they're going to win well, then the, the uh, uh, Mound Builders Golf Club will have to move elsewhere. And, um, you know, they will, uh, you know, develop this site into, you know, something to like, a, they will include a visitor site, offer a great deal more access, um, and also put it on a list of the World Heritage Site listing. Although even, you know, there's really not any money associated with it. They do have an emergency fund. I think if you really, if, if, uh, um, municipalities or, or states run into problems, you know, really significant problems. But the big hope is that it would be a big uh, tr tourism draw like it is in Great Britain. Marinette Pember, thank you. Thank you so much. When we come back, April is National Poetry Month. We'll hear Elise Passion read her poem, The Tree Agreement, to see what she's been up to during this pandemic. This is the 25th year celebrating National Poetry Month. It was started by the, America, the Academy of American Poets in 1996. Indian country has several high profile poets and among them is Elise Passion. She is Osage and lives in Chicago. Passion is the author of several books and her poems have been printed in a variety of magazines. Welcome Elise. Thank you so much, great to be here. How has the pandemic inspired or changed poetry? Well, to be honest, I believe that it's a silver lining for many writers. So many writers are introverts and they enjoy just hibernating and writing. And I think a lot of writers have produced many, many poems during the pandemic. Well, uh, in fact, Joy Harjo was on this program and she said she's never been more productive because she doesn't have to travel and do all the things that she normally does. And it's been a, that silver lining. Yes. She's a very dear friend of mine, and I'm happy that she's had a chance just to stay home because she travels more than anybody else I know. So she's had a very productive year. What should people know about Poetry Month and how do, how do folks access thinking about poetry in a new way? So I just wanted to say a little bit about the history. I'm glad you said it's the 25th anniversary. Um, I, back then, used to run an organization, a nonprofit called the Poetry Society of America. And um, we're the oldest poetry organization in America. The Academy was founded after the PSA. And um, we all gathered, all the different nonprofits, um, I guess in New York City gathered and talked about Poetry Month and beginning Poetry Month and what which month should be Poetry Month. And it was decided that April should be the month. So as a writer, you know, we want every single month to be Poetry Month. We want people to acknowledge Poetry Month, but it's a nice opportunity to really focus on poets and poetry. And there's all sorts of things people can take advantage of. They can see many, many readings, attend readings when we're out of this pandemic. Um, poems a day, it's just, it's just been, a, it's a very exciting period for poetry. In this period, and now as we're approaching summer, more and more people are out and about and doing things. And I understand the poem you're going to read with us is about that. So the poem I'm going to read is inspired by a real life incident. Um, we live in an apartment, we live in a, we live in a house in um, Chicago but we don't have a yard and we have decks outside of our, um, you know, each floor. And there is a beautiful tree that, that I write about in this poem that doesn't belong to us, but belongs to the neighbor. And the title of the poem is called The Tree Agreement. 
um, we actually entered, we signed a contract with the neighbor, which was a tree agreement. Um, and I think the rest will be pretty evident. The tree agreement, the neighbor calls the Siberian elm a weed tree, demands we hack it down, says the leaves overwhelm his property, the square backyard. He's collar and tie, a weed tree, branches, screen buildings, subway tracks, his patch of yard. We disagree, claim back the sap, heartwood, wild bark. He declares the tree hazardous. We shelter under leaf hoard, crossway for squirrels, branch house for sparrows, jays. The balcony soaks up the shade. Chatter song drowns out cars below. Sun branches down, leaves overwhelm. The tree will stay. We tell him no. Root deep through pavement, elm. Thank you, the tree agreement. I, I want to ask you about, um, there's going to be a lot of attention very shortly on Osage history with uh, the film Killers of the Flower Moon. And you've written your own stories and poems about this. Uh, maybe tell our viewers a little bit about that. Well, since I was in high school, I've been fascinated by Osage history and particularly this aspect of Osage history. And fortunately for me in Chicago, and that's where we last saw each other, is I was able to go to the Newberry Library and do research. Fast forward, I lived in New York, moved back to Chicago, my hometown, and I um, had a fellowship at the Newberry, the Francis Allen Fellowship, to write about the Reign of Terror. Anyway, as things would happen, I ended up, I was pregnant, and I, I never wrote that book, but I did end up writing a poem called Wigia, which is spoken by Anna Kyle Brown. Um, sorry, I'm excuse me. I did write a poem called Wigia, which is spoken by Molly Burkhart, whose sister Anna Kyle Brown was murdered during the Reign of Terror. Um, and uh, at some point, David Gran contacted me and asked me questions. And I, you know, introduced him to my relatives. And I said, you know, I've written this poem. And in fact, a line from the poem is the title of his book, Killers of the Flower Moon. I, I was actually thinking about the poem you wrote about your mother and the family stories, but I, I, that's fascinating. I'm, I'm really delighted to hear that. And so for those who don't know, the Reign of Terror took, part, took place in the 20s in Oklahoma. Um, at that time, the Osage were considered one of the richest people in the world because of the oil under their land. And um, white people came to the small town of Fairfax, Oklahoma, where my mother was born, my aunt, my uncle, and married the Osage women and then killed them for their head rights. So this family that I focused on um, was one of those families who were the victims of all these terrible crimes. And I did not know the story of the title. That's really interesting. I know. <laughs> he, he credits me. He actually publishes my poem in his book. He doesn't say that the, the, a line from the poem is the title, but I'm happy with what I have. <laughs> I also remember a poem where you write about family stories and just the weight of Osage history, uh, yes. and particularly your mother's stories. Yes. Well, actually, um, I've been asked to be the guest poet for um, Native American Heritage Month two years ago, well, a year and a half ago at the um, University of Missouri. And um, I had just, I'm an anthologist as well, and I had just produced a new anthology called The Eloquent Poem. And my editor um, invited me to come to University of Missouri, launch the anthology, and also give this reading for Native American Heritage Month. And I started researching the history of the Osage in Missouri and actually, I'm now my new my new work in progress is a long poem inspired by my Osage heritage. Um, so far, I'm up to 14 poems. They're interlinked, 
So the last line of each poem becomes the first line of the next poem. So I see it as a bracelet of poems in this long poem sequence. So yes, yeah, so and now I'm really writing about my family history. <laughs> and oh, that's actually, exciting. I'll just, keep, I'll just keep chattering away. Um, Joy Harjo included um, one of those poems, Heritage 10, in her Living Nations uh, Living Words project with the Library of Congress. So, um, so it's exciting to have the poem out in the world, one of those poems. Very good. At least we only have about a minute left. And I, I love asking, how do you encourage young people to write poetry? So the most important thing for young people to do, and for anyone who wants to be a writer, is to read poetry. Um, for me, I was very lucky that my parents gave me a copy of the Oxford Book of Poetry for Children when I was in second grade, and that's what hooked me. I became fascinated with, with William Blake and William Shakespeare. So I encourage young people to read. And I'll put in another plug for some of my anthologies. I have a book for little ones called Poetry Speaks to Children. And then I also have an anthology for tweens and teens called Poetry Speaks Who I Am. So those are good places to start. Excellent. Elise Passion, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And you can find more of her world, uh, work at elisepassion.com. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. Thank you for watching. We will be back with another edition tomorrow. I'm Mark Trahan. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run. Indian Country Today is produced at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. This is Indian Country Today.